I wanted to start by commenting on today's first reading from Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. Notice he, how he talks about the day of the Lord, how some people are saying the day of the Lord is already here. In other words, it's like already upon you. And what he's referring to is the second coming of Christ. It was um, a common belief of many of the early Christians that the second coming of Christ was imminent. And sometimes people, because they thought it was imminent, they actually didn't act the way that they should have. So, for example, St. Paul is encouraging the Christians to continue to spread the faith, to do what they can to help the poor and things like that. But sometimes when people think, oh, the second coming is imminent, why do anything? Why not just, just wait for it? You know, imagine young people today, for example, if, if they knew that the second coming was imminent, why would they go to universities to study or something like that? So it's actually good that we don't know when the second coming of Christ is. And recall how Christ, when he speaks about the end times, in one of the passages he says, you know, it will be just like at the time of Noah. There will be people marrying and giving in marriage and eating and doing all the same kinds of stuff as, as all, at other times. And that's what we are called to do also. <coughs> now notice in today's gospel reading, this theme of, of the blindness of the scribes and the Pharisees is being reiterated. You know, that they, they observe the tiny details of the law, tithing the, you know, even uh, herbs and things like that, and yet they neglect the weightier matters of the law, such as justice, mercy, and faith. They're totally blind. And I pointed out that in reality, we are all a little bit blind, and we're all prone to pride. Pride blinds us. When we give in to pride, we deceive ourselves in regards to what we are really like. <coughs> so we're, we're all prone to this... this um, spiritual blindness. And this is why it's so important and beneficial for us to ask God to enlighten us. And notice how our Lord goes on to say, you clean the outside of the cup and of the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Now, how can a cup and plate be full of greed and self-indulgence? Well, of, co of course they cannot. So he's really referring to the fact that we make so much of an effort to look good externally. In other words, we clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside we are full of greed and self-indulgence. Now he's talking about the Pharisees, but as I mentioned, it can apply to us also. So we need to look to the inside. And so often we're very concerned about our external appearance, and to a certain extent, it's, it's justifiable, it's important for us to look presentable, we gotta shave, comb our hair, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, especially young people, they're very concerned about their looks, they maybe wanna meet somebody to be able to get married or whatever, right? But how much time do we spend looking in the mirror, for example? Compare that to how much time we spend doing an examination of conscience. In other words, looking inside. You know, hopefully we do it twice a day before going to bed. And uh, sometimes it's good to do a particular exam and like you're focused on a particular virtue or vice. <coughs> and maybe halfway through the day, do an examination of conscience, how well you're doing and overcoming that particular bad inclination or growing in the opposite virtue. So it's good to do this examination of conscience, but as I mentioned, we tend to neglect it. Um, I wanted to comment on the fact that um, when it comes to this looking at ourselves, we tend to deceive ourselves. We tend to be blind to the ugliness within ourselves. And there's many reasons for that, and, and we don't like it. But, but I, I wanted to draw your attention, there's a, there's a novel I read years ago, and it's by Evelyn Waugh. I believe the title is The Decline and Fall, or Decline and Fall. And it's about a young man who's um, 
studying to become a, a clergyman for the Anglican Church. And he's a very good man, he's very righteous, um, but he always gets in trouble. And so he gets kicked out of school and he gets into trouble. Uh, eventually he's actually thrown into jail, but he's totally innocent. And even in jail, in prison, he gets into trouble and he's put into solitary confinement. But the way it's described in the novel, when he's in solitary confinement, He's very happy, he's very content. He has a routine, a procedure, like, you know, time to say his prayers and exercise, whatever. Like, he's totally fine. He's totally content being in solitary confinement. And there's a, there's a passage that kind of sticks out, and I think it's four walls do not a prison make, or stone walls do not a prison make. And, and it's a very significant kind of description. And, you know, when you think about it, a person who's, who's righteous, well, they're, they're okay in solitary confinement. But it's been pointed out that solitary confinement is one of the worst punishments for criminals. So much so that I, I heard that they're actually doing away with solitary confinement as a form of punishment because it's so, uh, so, so bad on, on these prisoners. And, and why would it be so bad on them? You see, when, in, when a person is in solitary confinement, they're forced to confront their conscience. And as they have nobody else to talk to, nobody to distract themselves from themselves, they might yell and scream and bang on the walls for a while, but eventually they're forced to confront their own conscience, to think about the crimes they have committed, the people that they have hurt. And when they do this, they don't like themselves. They get angry with themselves. And they might even harm themselves. Like, they don't like that. They want to suppress their conscience. They want to distract themselves from their conscience. And this is why it's so painful for them to do this, because they're not happy with themselves. They're not content. They're not at peace. Now, when we think of a righteous person being in solitary confinement, you know, in one sense, they're not totally alone. If they believe in God, God is with them. They can communicate with God. They have somebody to talk to. And it's like real. I mean, granted, you don't hear God speaking to us the way you would another person, but you're not alone. If you're an atheist and a vicious criminal, you are alone. Now, it's not entirely true because the demons are there with you. But you see, the demons, you're not even aware of their presence. And the demons can kind of intensify your hatred of yourself. The demons can motivate you to harm yourself. The demons can motivate you even to kill yourself. So this is why solitary confinement is so, so bad on individuals. However, the good thing of it is that, yes, it forces us to acknowledge our own sinfulness. And a person who believes in God will seek forgiveness from God. And even in prison, if, if you have no access to a priest, express your sorrow to God and trust in God's mercy. But, you know, something that we ourselves can do, as I mentioned, we're all blind. We all tend to deceive ourselves. And, you know, deep down, we probably have sins that we're kind of suppressing. It's good for us to kind of make a solitary confinement for ourselves, periodically, even on a daily basis. How do we do this? Through quality time spent with God. And this quality time, of course, is prayer. And I don't, I don't just mean like prayers that we recite like the rosary, but mental prayer, meditative prayer, where there's no set formula. I know that's where our mind is open, where God can inspire us, where we're more receptive on, of the inspiration that God gives us. And when we do this, sometimes we come to the realization that, okay, I, I have certain inclinations. I have certain sins that I am committing. And that realization is good because hopefully motivates us to do something about it. And this realization also humbles us and makes us realize I'm not any better than the other person. Like I, I have all these sins and, you know, that person, they're probably better off, a better person than I am. So it humbles us. And it's also good for us because it makes us trust in God and trust in God's mercy and be grateful for all that God has done for us, forgiving us our sins. Make it possible for us to have our sins forgiven so that we can be at peace with ourselves, not like those people in solitary confinement who are vicious criminals. We need to be at peace. We need this peace. Very, very important. So something good that we can do. 
And I wanted to touch a little bit on today's feast. It's the Feast of St. Monica, the mother of St. Augustine. And as we all know, she continued to pray for many years for the conversion of Augustine, and eventually he did convert. And so we honor her for, for her perseverance in prayer and also never giving up hope, trusting in God. And sure enough, Augustine not only converted, he eventually became a priest, a bishop, and was declared a doctor of the church. So let us imitate Saint Monica, praying for those that we love and care about, never giving up on them, always trusting in God, always having hope for our loved ones.